Hey everyone, Ryan here, and welcome back to our oral radiology series. My series on oral pathology goes into the specifics on what certain diseases will present as, but this video will cover the general interpretation principles. We'll go over things like caries detection and categorizing lesions and diseases. So my hope is that this video will help put everything together for you in the world of radiographic interpretation. So some interpretation principles. We have to know what normal is. We have to have a mental image of normal anatomy. You need to know what normal looks like to be able to pick up on what is abnormal. We can compare the right and left sides, particularly for a panoramic x-ray. The principle of symmetry is important because humans are naturally symmetric to some degree, so we can take advantage of that to observe the right and left sides and compare them. We can categorize the disease or abnormality into particular radiographic categories. And we should start globally, assess the big picture, things like symmetry, following the corticated borders, and then we can go locally, look at the crowns of the teeth, PDL spaces, canal structure, and things like that. So let's start with some radiolucent lesions and how to categorize them based on appearance. So the first one here is the corticated unilocular radiolucency. And the name kind of speaks for itself. Unilocular means that it has one compartment. So there's one central compartment here. And corticated means that there is a radiopaque border that surrounds it. And here we see that here. And this is a great example of a corticated unilocular radiolucency. We can also have the non-corticated variety. This is where, again, we still have one compartment, but there's no clear border this time. So for this radiolucency, there's no clear radiopaque border around it, and the edges are a bit more diffuse and hard to trace. We can also have a multilocular radiolucency this time. But there are multiple compartments, and they're usually separated by these thin radiopaque septations. This is a great example of a multilocular radiolucency. Similar, but a little bit different, we have the multifocal confluent radiolucency. This time multifocal means that there are multiple points of origin. So in the multilocular radiolucency, there is one central part, one point of origin. This time, not so clear. We have several points of origin, and all of these radiolucencies may be separate from each other, but they might be beginning to converge and merge with each other, and that's where the confluent part comes in. Confluent means that they're beginning to converge on one another. We can also have a moth-eaten radiolucency, and in this case, it's hard to trace. These edges are ragged, they're irregular, and moth-eaten is a pretty appropriate description of this. They can be generalized and affect a wide portion of the mouth, but in this case, it's more localized to one specific region. All right, now for some radiopaque lesions. We have the focal opacity, and this is the basic single site. There's one central point of origin, and it can be homogeneous, where the whole thing is the same density, like we see in this case, or it can be heterogeneous, and there are varying densities of that radiopaque lesion. We can also have a target lesion. It's very interesting. It has a very unique uh, structure to it. It has a radiopaque center. There's a clear radiolucent band that surrounds that. And then there's a corticated border around that, making it look like a target. The classic target lesion would be a complex odontoma, like we see here. The multifocal confluent radiopacity is the same concept as the radiolucent variety, but this time it's radiopaque. So again, we're gonna have multiple points of origin, and if they're close to each other, they're gonna to begin to converge on one another. And that's where the, again, the confluent part comes in. We can also have irregular radiopacities. This one's characterized by ill-defined ragged edges. The classic lesion for this would be an osteosarcoma, like we see here. This is an aggressive tumor that destroys bone and creates new bone. 
The ground glass radio opacity is another important one to know for the board exam. This one's defined by a fine granular or orange peel appearance. The mixed density lesion has both radiopaque and radiolucent components. Sometimes it's corticated, has this clear radiopaque border surrounding it, and sometimes it's not. So this one is going to be heterogeneous by nature because again, there are multiple densities at play here. Sometimes you'll find a mixed density lesion around the crown of an unerupted tooth. Sometimes you'll see it in the maxillary sinus and sometimes even in the zygoma or the maxilla. And then we have the soft tissue opacity. This refers to a calcification that's embedded within the soft tissue, not within the hard tissue or bone of the jaws. Speaking of which, this is an awesome diagram to refer to for soft tissue calcifications as viewed in a panoramic. This can be incredibly helpful to study and to reference when you see any kind of radiopacity that seems out of place, that seems abnormal, and it appears in a very specific location in the pan. So let's go over these briefly. We have the phlebolith or phlebolith. This is a calcified blood clot, and it's usually in the pterygoid plexus. This is located by the sigmoid notch up here or by the pterygomaxillary fissure. It's rarely located down here by the mandibular angle where the facial artery and facial vein cross. We have the thyroid cartilage, which is located down here. Calcified lymph nodes. They have a characteristic cauliflower-like appearance, and they tend to appear at the angle of the mandible. Tonsilloliths. These are the most common calcification that you'll see. It's a potential cause of halitosis or bad breath, and they're usually superimposed over the ramus. A calcified atheromatous plaque will appear below the angle at the level of the hyoid bone. So it's usually in line with C3, C4 of the cervical vertebrae. An antrolith refers to a calcified mass in the maxillary sinus, so appropriately it will be located up here. The stylohyoid ligament can be ossified, and so this is going to connect the styloid process up here to the hyoid bone down here. And so if that happens to be ossified, it'll appear as this thin radiopacity. And lastly, we can have sialoliths. These are often in the submandibular gland, which will be down here, or the Wharton's duct up here by the mandibular incisors. So it'll be linear, it'll be a little bit more flat if it's in a duct. It'll be a bit more round if it's located in a gland. And so just by looking at the location and some of the shapes that these can appear in, you can get a pretty good idea of what you're looking at. So this is really, really helpful, just an incredibly helpful reference. This is another great thing to reference. It's a really great summary chart to compare the radiographic features of benign and malignant lesions. So let's go through this a little bit. We have benign in the left column, malignant on the right. The first category are the margins. These are the edges of the lesion. For a benign lesion, they're gonna to tend to be more well-defined. That means a narrow zone of transition. There's not a whole lot of transition between the edge of the lesion and the rest of normal tissue. The margins will be smooth, regular, and you'll sometimes or usually get some kind of cortication that's clearly defining the borders. Malignant is going to be ill-defined. There's a wide zone of transition. It's unclear where the edges are. Ragged and a moth-eaten appearance are all characteristic of malignancies. For benign, the shape will tend to be more round or oval. Malignant, again, going to be more irregular. For internal architecture, what's going on inside the lesion, for tumors, they're going to tend to be more multilocular, multiple compartments. They're also more likely to resorb the roots of teeth, whereas cysts are going to be more unilocular, hydrostatic, which means they're expansile, 
and they'll tend to be more corticated. Both tumors and cysts, we're talking about benign lesions here, but it's a helpful way to distinguish between these two, sometimes hard to distinguish, benign lesions. And for malignancies, the internal architecture is usually going to be radiolucent. I did talk about one exception, the osteosarcoma, which will be irregular and radiopaque. As far as location, a benign lesion will be usually coronal or above the mandibular canal, whereas a malignancy will appear in the ramus or posterior body of the mandible can be superimposed with or below the mandibular canal area. Effect on cortical bone. A benign lesion will expand the bone. It could thin the corticated borders of bone, like the inferior border of the mandible. It may erode cortical bone if it's really aggressive, like an ameloblastoma, but the typical benign lesion will not do so. A malignant lesion is more likely to erode cortical bone or otherwise just destroy it. The effect on the maxillary sinus is similar. Benign lesions will displace it, whereas malignancies will erode or destroy it. Effect on the mandibular canal, benign lesions will displace it with very limited neurosensory disturbances, whereas malignancies can invade and downright destroy that canal, and you can get some anesthesia or paresthesia as a direct effect of that. Benign lesions can displace teeth, they may even block their eruption, whereas malignancies will cause floating teeth. This means they eat all the bone around the teeth, they might even eat some of the tooth roots and resorb them away, and then you end up with this appearance like teeth are just floating in space because everything supporting them has been destroyed underneath. And then for the effect on tooth roots, benign lesions will tend to cause horizontal resorption, malignancies will tend to cause vertical resorption. This will result in spiked roots, or if there's not much resorption at all and it's more eating away at the bone, you'll get that floating teeth phenomenon that we just talked about. And then as far as the effect on the PDL space and lamina dura, malignancies will tend to cause an asymmetric widening of the PDL space and a loss of the lamina dura. So these are just some of the many ways you can distinguish benign and malignant lesions from each other. And hopefully this can play a role on your board exam if you get a question that asks you to interpret a radiographic image. You have all these things in your toolbox that you can take out and help you answer the question. All right, so how about caries detection? Well, radiographs are, of course, crucial for detecting and diagnosing caries. And one thing to know is that carious lesions are always smaller radiographically than they are clinically. And this is because a tooth needs about 30 to 40% mineral loss before it'll begin to show up on a radiograph as radiolucent. So this means that a white spot incipient lesion will hardly be visible on an x-ray. An enamel cavitation will be a bit more evident, and then lesions into the dentin layer will be clearly evident. For an interproximal lesion, this will typically appear as a tiny triangular radiolucency that's right at or below the proximal contact. And so that is a classic interproximal lesion. That one's fairly small though, it's not into the dentin layer yet, so it can be hard to pick up on. An occlusal carious lesion is much tougher to see radiographically. It's going to be this subtle radiolucency that's slightly darker than dentin. Beneath a fissure is the most common location. It's going to have these diffuse borders, so it's hard to exactly trace where this lesion stops at. So that's the nature of these occlusal caries lesions. They're going to be hard to trace. And they're going to remain relatively centered on the crown. For a buccal or lingual pit caries, these are going to be circular and they're going to have sharper borders and it's going to be located at the level of a buccal or lingual pit that you'd have in a molar. Like the occlusal caries, they're going to be much easier to see clinically. It's going to be much more clear that you have caries there when you do visual inspection than if you just simply rely on the x-ray alone. For recurrent or secondary caries, this is going to occur 
under or gingival to an already existing restoration. A bite wing can hide these, especially if they're not too deep. A PA will tend to reveal them thanks to the vertical angulation. So this is one case where a periapical may be even more useful than a bite wing to detect caries. And then lastly for root caries, these are going to be hemispherical at or below the cemento enamel junction. And this is where the root edge is going to appear to disappear and it's going to be hard to trace in the area of that carious lesion. Typically the lesion will also have diffuse rounded inner borders. Now this can be easily confused with this which is called cervical burnout. And cervical burnout is a phenomenon caused by relatively low x-ray absorption on the mesial and distal surfaces of teeth right here at the cemento enamel junction. With this kind of radiolucency though, you can still clearly trace the outline of the root. And so unlike this area where the root just seems to disappear, we can still trace it and though, even though there's a shadow there, we can be confident that that is not a carious lesion. For periodontitis detection, we can also use x-rays to evaluate bone loss. Mild bone loss is defined as the bone level being lower than normal, but still being in the upper third of the root. A typical presentation of mild bone loss is where this alveolar crest area is going to become a bit fuzzy. It's not going to be quite as clear as it would be in a normal healthy patient. The normal bone level should be about one to two millimeters below the cemento enamel junction. So mild bone loss may be an additional one to two millimeters of bone loss beyond that point. Moderate bone loss refers to bone loss where the bone level is at the middle third of the root. So we're talking about greater than two millimeters of bone loss at this stage, because again, if the CEJ let's say is somewhere close to this point, one to two millimeters may be normal. Another one to two millimeters might be mild. Once we get to this stage, now we're talking about moderate bone loss. And then of course we have severe bone loss, which is going to be the lower third of the root. So you can see the trend here. We start with upper, we go to middle, and then we go to lower. So we can really break this up into three thirds. And for severe bone loss, we most often We'll see this appear first in the mandibular anterior region, since calculus tends to form here the quickest, and bone is rather thin in this area. And so these are examples of severe bone loss where it's encroaching on the apices of those teeth. The last thing I wanna talk about is something called the buccal object or slob rule. A dental x-ray, again, is a two-dimensional image of a three-dimensional object, which means that it's going to have some inherent limitations, mainly that we don't get any sense of depth. But if you take two images of the same spot at slightly different angles, you can gain this sense of depth. You can gleam where an object is. Maybe it's an impacted tooth or a certain root canal and whether it's buccal or lingual and slob stands for same lingual opposite buckle, and we'll get to that in just a moment. So the best way to visualize this rule is to hold up a peace sign with your dominant hand in front of your face, with your fingers just like this, so that we're all on the same page. I'll refer to this as the index finger and this as the middle finger. Now, rotate your hand so that your index finger and middle finger are in line with one another. Squint one eye so that your index finger is completely blocking your middle finger from your view. Now keep your hand exactly how it is, keep one eye closed, and move your head slightly to the right so that you can see your middle finger peeking out from behind your index finger. Now notice that as you move your head to the right, the middle finger appears to move along with you to the right. Now the same thing happens if you move your head to the left. The middle finger appears to move left in the direction of your head. 
And this is the buckle object rule. As you move the x-ray tube head in one direction, the object that's further away from the tube head, that's more lingual, will move in the same direction as the tube head. In other words, the lingual object moves in the same direction, the buccal object moves in the opposite direction. So let's see how that plays out in a real life clinical example. So let's say we only had this image on the left and we wanted to know which root canal was buccal and which canal was lingual. Well, frankly, we'd have no idea just looking at that one image. But if we take a second image at a different horizontal angulation, now we have all we need to determine that information. So this left image is a canine premolar periapical. The right image is a lateral incisor canine periapical. So all we really have to do is determine which direction we moved the tube head from this image to this image. Well, we're moving closer to the lateral incisor and closer to the central incisor. So we're moving the tube head anteriorly. And this canal with the arrow pointing to it is also appearing to move closer to those incisors, moving anteriorly. So that has to be the lingual canal and the other one has to be the buccal canal. Same lingual, opposite buccal. Let's take a look at another example using our peace sign trick. In the first image here, we have two canals that are superimposed on top of each other. So we moved the tube head a little bit anteriorly and changed the angle so that we could see both root canals clearly separated. So the first thing we need to do is determine which direction the tube head moved. Well, this is the patient's right side. We're looking at that side of their mouth. So we can imagine that the tube head would be somewhere over here for the left image, and then somewhere over here more anteriorly for the right image. So the tube head moved anteriorly, or in this case, to the right. So next up, hold your peace sign up and put both fingers in line with each other. Your index finger represents the buccal root canal that's closer to you, closer to the tube head, and your middle finger represents the lingual root canal, farther from you, farther from the tube head. Then move your head to the right, just like the tube head did in this example. And which finger do you see to the left, and which one do you see to the right? So your index finger should be to the left, and your middle finger should be to the right. So the blue arrow is pointing to the buccal canal, and the red arrow is pointing to the lingual canal. Another way to say it is the root canal with the red arrow moved in the same direction as the tube head. So same lingual and then opposite buccal. And that's all there is to it. You can do this for horizontal angulation changes, just like in these two examples, but you can also do this for vertical angulation changes as well. In that case, you would just hold the peace sign horizontally and move your head up and down to simulate the change in tube head location. So that's it for this video, guys. Thank you so much for watching. Please like this video if you enjoyed it and subscribe to this channel for more on dentistry. If you're interested in supporting this channel and what I do, please check out my Patreon page. Thank you to all of my patrons for their support. You can unlock extras like access to my video slides to take notes on and practice questions for the board exams. So go check that out. The link is in the description. Thanks again for watching everyone. I'll see you in the next video.